fade out weren't too bad was it almost dj esque i would say um greetings everyone thank you for joining me on this live stream and i'm hoping i'm gonna get some positive feedback because i made some mic adjustments so i've made some microphone adjustments now it's added a few a little bit of compression and other things so I should be loud and clear. I am very well aware that my last live stream that I did the um, response to Metatron, the audio was low. I played that back and I was like, oh yeah, this audio is really low. People will be struggling to hear me. Um, but that shouldn't be the case this time around. It should be nice and loud. So let me know in the chat if it's nice and loud, if everyone can hear me okay. Let me know if I'm nice and audible, okay? Um, I won't really... I can't really move on until I get that good feedback. Okay, cool. So let's see what's coming through. Um, let me know. Okay, no doubt, bro. You're coming through good. And by the way, the, so the volume should be good now. Now, a couple of things to... It is clipping slightly. And I'm kind of like, well, you know, <laughs> we're going to have to live with that because it's better than not being able to hear me. And also, if it feels a little... It's compressing everything now. So if it feels a little bit like an ASMR session... <laughs> I don't want to hear people comp complaining to me about the fact they can hear every time my lips smack together or something. <laughs> yeah, that's that's out of my control now. All right, we are we are we are prioritizing clarity over everything. So, yeah, that's where we are. So anyway, I've had a few people getting back to me now. Thank you very much, people who put in the chat to let me know that I'm coming through loud and clear. Um, it should be good. It should be good. I don't have to sit so close to the mic now as well. Like I'm eating the microphone. I don't have to do that either, which is a nice little change. So what are we doing today? Well, thank you for joining. And if you have seen the thumbnail, you will have a, a bit of a, a good clue about the topic that we're going to be dealing with today. And that's the, uh, the, the truth um, about the malls of Europe now. This subject has not been an easy one for me. Yeah, this 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 subject has definitely not been an easy one for me. Uh, not because it's it's hard for me to um, have a discussion or conversation about it, or it's hard for me to put content together. It's more I'm really mindful on this topic about the order 
in which I attack it because it's one of those topics where if I was just to come out and kind of just like, it, it's, 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 it's like any topic, you know, because of the position that we're in, in the kind of um, black history space of our history being so suppressed, everything that we do sounds a little bit crazy when you first hear it. So even if if I'm going to be totally transparent, even to me, first hearing about, you know, black Egypt, when I, when that first kind of hit me, I was like, oh, that's that's crazy. But that's because prior to that, I had no idea about, you know, black contributions historically outside of Africa or even within Africa in certain places that had been claimed. So because of these kind of very limited and structured paradigms that people are approaching these topics with, it means me as a content creator and as a researcher, even you'll see in my ancient Egypt stuff, there is a there is a bit of a strategy in terms of the way in which I release information and data and, you know, I, I'll go for more kind of challenging things after I feel like I've laid the groundwork. So I've been a bit slow, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, welcome all, everyone who's in the chat, I see lots of familiar faces. But yeah, I've been a little bit slow in attacking this subject, um, admittedly so. And that's not to say I haven't been because I've been doing loads of writing and research and I just kind of like just putting those final touches and getting stuff out hasn't been the easiest thing to do. I do have that one short about the um, about Morris dancers, which was good. Um, and I've also got a slightly longer version on my um, King Mono show channel which I think we'll start off today with as well actually. That'll be a good one to kind of start today with so everyone can kind of... Um, get familiar with the subject but yeah in terms of this subject i've been slow but in saying all that thankfully thankfully we've got other creators out there doing a fantastic job and one of the creators that i'm going to be we're going to be looking at their content today is a young um budding scholar by the name of kapruki who um i really love his stuff i've plugged it before and he's done two very excellent videos about the moors in europe both of them are really, really quite excellent. So we're going to take some time today and we're going to watch both of them and I'm going to kind of react to them. And I'm really grateful that he's done them because it just, <laughs> it feels like it buys me some time in terms of producing the content. Um, kind of topic we're going to cover and they're going to turn around, they're going to call you a black supremacist. <laughs> we're going to accuse you of blackwashing history, but you know our approach on this channel. And that's going to be, we're not going to propose anything that doesn't have any evidence. So there's not going to be any kind of like proposition of some kind of, you know, wild outlandish things. These are things that are going to have lots of weighty evidence back in them. And then it's up to you and the level of, you know, cognitive adjustment you need to make, really. But anyway, let me make, make a quick shout out to HH, who has just donated two euros i appreciate you um i'm not sure what, where you're tuning in from ireland or the mainland europe um i appreciate it we are uniting and no one can stop it support 100 percent. thank you very much and i appreciate your generous donation and then a lovely 20 dollars from pepwin7 as well who i missed last time um but i'm not gonna miss you this time says you're doing a really good job bro keep it going i will i will keep it keep it going definitely um so um yeah there's there's uh, i mean already in the chat it's great to see you guys are so um very much involved in this and i'm sure lots of people want to cover loads of topics but i mean this is a topic that will take a lifetime to cover in its entirety anyway so we're going to try and get the most that we can get out today so let's start from a really Ah, oh, Germany, man. Sorry, HH, you just made a donation, said they're in Germany. So they they will know. Actually, you're going to have a good one today then because Germany, this is like, Germany I'm finding historically feels like it's kind of ground zero for a lot of what happened in Western Europe in terms of black presence. It's the, the, the German footprint was absolutely massive. And this is, yeah, this is going to shock a lot of people. The fact that historically black people have had kingdoms, <laughs> provinces, royalty, nobility all over Europe. But 
Germany, particularly I'm finding the Bavarian area had massive, massive black presence. And actually we have to be really careful because they're actively trying to erase this presence as well. So it's not something that's kind of like happened and they've let it go. You have certain houses and we're going to get into some of this actually as we cover in, in the video. So I don't want to spoil it too much, but there's got, you've got certain houses such as the house that our queen comes from. She comes from a house called the house of Sax Goethe Coburg and the house of Coburg has a black patron saint. Okay. And a black founder, you know, so the, I mean, the, it's my, it's mind blown to be honest with you. It's mind blown. When I first got into this subject, it was just a, a few things. And I wish I could take you through that story, but there isn't the time today, but there's so much. And Sir Percher, I just said, Benjamin Franklin has this quote where he called the Germans swarthy. It makes no sense in the context they claim it to be right now. And you know what? That's an excellent place to start. So let's do that. Because I actually wanted to cover that Benjamin Franklin quote because I thought this would be a nice little landing place. Because what we're going to try and do is just build a bit of a picture, give people a little bit of, you know, data on the subject, kind of see the things that were said historically and then we'll just ease our way in ease our way in and yeah we'll get there eventually so actually before we go into that quote the one thing i did want to do is actually put up the picture this picture that i use for the thumbnail and i see a lot of people recognize this picture it's called um wild men and the moors so i'm going to put it full screen okay and actually this is only a, about a quarter of the tapestry this tapestry is very long so i'll show you the full long one today well, this is this is the called the Wild Men and the Moors. So this tapestry was formed in around 1440. So I want you to be mindful of that date. Think about what was happening in Europe in 1440. Okay, if we go to the south of Europe, we have the final pushes to basically exterminate and eradicate the Moors. Okay, so in Spain and Portugal, we have the fall of the Andalusian Empire which is happening and that's the obviously the moors who were the the black europeans falling in that area this is pre any kind of um african slave trade but this is coming to i would say the middle ground of the european slave trade where the the the, the muslims and the moors would take european slaves often um you know that's where we get the word slav from obviously so this is that would have been kind of like in full kilt at this stage in history. And if we have a, excuse me, if we have a look at this image, let's 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 really have a look at what we're seeing. OK, so to the left, we have these people called the wild men. OK, so the tapestry, I think that this is just basically a an attempt to show you kind of like what their body hair looks like. So these are very kind of like hairy men, but you can see phenotypically, these are essentially Western slash Northern Europeans or modern Western slash Northern Europeans. Okay, these are, you know, light skinned, very fair haired people. Okay, and they've got what looks like claws, but it's obviously would have just been kind of unkept nails. These are people clearly who live outdoors. And then we have a Moorish castle here and the people who inhabit this Moorish castle, as you can see, alternating black and brown, brown, black, brown. Where have we seen that habit before? Is that, a, does anyone know where we've seen that trend before of alternating black and brown? So you can say alternating shades of black and brown, not painted just in black, okay? So just bear that in mind, because a lot of people think that black people always depict themselves in jet black, and <laughs> that's really not the case. Um, tend to be more artistically um, aware than that because most of us have brown skin. So you can see this kind of alternating black and brown. And you can see this is clearly a king and this is clearly a queen. They wear crowns, okay? Crowns that we associate with modern European crowns. And actually, I think it was Trill Black. Um, there's a content creator called Trill Black who did a, a post recently that shows the, the, the decapitated head of four Moorish kings, which is, you know, it's quite disturbing, but it, it falls, it kind of shows 
what was happening in and around this time. So you can see this castle, okay, this is a castle, you can see the four towers there. You can see that this castle, and you can see this um, tower here, is coming under siege by these wild men, okay? And the Moors, these black Europeans are defending it. Now, one of the things that I want you to bear in mind here is that we're told that more equals Muslim, aren't we? We're told that more equals Muslim, more is synonymous with Muslim. But you can see here, and from the 19th century dictionary that we read from, if you, if you were on that live stream, there's no mention of Muslim when you look in a dictionary. When I look in that dictionary, and I've got it right behind me, 1827 dictionary, it just says Negro. So they're very clear on what Moors mean. So when people even try and start this argument, oh, well, Moors were Muslims of Northern Europeans knew exactly what Moors were, okay? Moors were black people, okay? They were just black people. That's why they were called Moors. There was, there was nothing else to it. They were black people, okay? And then you could be a Moorish Christian, or you could be a Moorish Muslim. And these ones here appear to me to be Moorish Christians. The crown looks like Christian, the kind of crowns that were worn in Christendom as opposed to Islam. So this is a Christian Moorish castle, okay? Coming under attack from these wild men. Now there's a little bit more to this as well. So I'm just gonna show you the full one, just so you get a, full perspective of what this tapestry looks like so this is the long one okay it's got a full screen this quickly so this is the long one it's not as detailed as the one i just showed you but you can see the full tapestry here so here's what we just looked at here's the wild men okay attacking the castle okay full of moors okay and if we scroll along a bit we can see the wild men tussling with lions unicorns and dragons now this could be literal but it also could be a communication of what's taking place because if you'll notice here there's a coat of arms or it looks like a shield that's being broken i haven't researched exactly what that coat of arms represents but you know that unicorns lions and dragons are all commonly used as animals on coats of arms and they're not commonly found in germany from what i know Okay, so this might be a depiction of the fact that these wild men are taking over houses of nobility. And these would have been the kind of an animals or mythical creatures associated with those houses of nobility. And they're bringing them, they're either slaying them or bringing them under control. So that's an interpretation there. Okay, and then you can see over here, you have this kind of like the wild men feeding this wife and you have children so there's a story being told here about for want of a better word a population replacement taking place this castle's coming under siege it doesn't look like it's going to stand if you look at it visibly okay they're subduing and taking over the houses and the kind of animals or the um the what's the word the kind of i want to say figurines or one of a better well i'll think of a better word but it kind of like the emblems associated there you guys better word the emblems associated with these royal houses are being brought under control tamed or slayed okay and then they're reproducing their own okay and you can see that symbol there that's on this broken shield is replicated over here as well so maybe that's another um sign of them kind of like taking over those various houses so as opposed to eradicating them they're going to replace these houses and this seems to be what the pattern was can i just give a quick shout out to afo podcast who says understanding the moors is critical there is so much misinformation on the subject absolutely there's so much and there's going to be a lot that we cover today. So that was a good place to start. And I just wanted you to see that picture because this image was, like I said, developed in 1440. Okay, this is medieval. This is a time that would have been the tail end of the, um, 
Moorish occupation, they call it. Although I don't like to call it that because I'm actually skeptical that there was even a Moorish invasion. I actually think they might have been indigenous. Um, I've got, I'm not going to go into that too much detail, but I think that the Moors, my personal perspective from the research I've done kind of leans towards the Moors being kind of always being there <laughs> and they're not being very they're not being that much in Europe before they basically kind of developed Europe there wasn't any really anything there to develop before they came and when I say Europe I'm obviously not I'm obviously counting out here Rome and Greece I'm talking about the rest of Europe particularly Northern Europe there wasn't anything there before the Moors started building essentially there wasn't any time for between the fall of the Roman Empire, which was around 400 and 440 AD, I think it was, and the invasion of the Moors, which was 700 AD, there wasn't enough time for anything to be developed. And if we're going to believe this tapestry, it doesn't look like the people were civilised enough to have developed any, any, anything. So the Moors really were responsible for the Renaissance and responsible for the development of Europe otherwise Europe wouldn't have been developed so let's let's part that now okay we've had that discussion I'm gonna have a little bit of a, a dive into the chat to see if there's anything I need to respond to I know I've got a couple of my admins moderators here today so over the moon thank you Wesker who is here oh it's just Wesker so you're doing a solo job Wesker I appreciate it <laughs> um, I'm gonna have a quick. I'm just having a quick scan through the comments, um, and thank you, AFO, AFO Podcast, for the twenty dollars donation. I really appreciate it. Whilst I'm doing that, actually, hit up the likes. Yeah, um, Moorish Christians were also kicked out during the Inquisition. Absolutely, um, that's what Macy's just said. I totally agree with that. Um, because Moors was not a description of religion, as we've been falsely. Um, told and also more does not equal North African yes there are <laughs> here's the thing this is when um, language started to be used as a tool of obfuscation on the European continent because the origin the origin of the term more would have been related to Africans okay and even when people say North Africans it's not actually correct because actually the first the place that they really are referring to when it comes to the first moors was not north africans it was mauritanians who are technically west africans so if we're going to talk about what the word war more you know originally came from it came from west africa because mauritania is west africa it's right next to mali so these were west africans not north africans okay and they like to kind of like confuse you and kind of associate more with Algerians and Moroccans, but no, it was it was West Africans, okay? They were the first to be called Moors. So you have this kind of like West African population that are associated with the word Moor, but then you also, in my view, have an indigenous, dark-skinned European population to deal with. And they are the ones who have kind of been lost in the obfuscation. Yeah, it, it gets very complicated. But anyway, we don't need to go into too much detail. I'm just having a look through. There's not really that much more that I'm going to dive into. Most popular more of all time. I mean, it's, this is interesting that you mentioned that. Um, Othello, being the most popular more of all time, was a Christian. Absolutely. And do you remember in the last live stream that I did when we were looking at Metatron's video that Metatron mentioned Othello? And he kind of mentioned it, and I'm not I'm not saying this to be kind of any way disrespectful, because this is what everyone does, including myself in childhood when I didn't know. Just said, you know, our fellow was an Arab, you know, and they've used the same word to describe him because we've all been lied to. And this is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with people who have attempted their very best to write us completely out of history. I remember specifically when I was in high school, being told by asking, you know, my teacher what was, um, actually I didn't even ask my teacher, before we even got into the book of Othello, my teacher explaining to everybody, well, Othello was a Moor and Moors were North African people, you know, they were, you know, described as swarthy and swarthy basically is, you know, a very light brown colour and that's what Othello was. Othello was a very light brown kind of North African. But then I remember reading the book and then not marrying with any of the quotes, the amount of times they call him a black this and a black that. <laughs> it's almost like you're in, you know, middle America. 
you know what I mean? Like he's been called a black this and a black. So it, it wasn't marrying, obviously. And I found it quite interesting the way they kind of like preface and they really prime the minds of people. So it wasn't surprising when um, Metatron raised it that he had a very limited view. It's like, oh, my fellow was a Moor. Like, what, what are you talking about? You know, he, he, Moors are Arabs. And he wouldn't know any better. And you wouldn't know any better until you start reading, you know, and finding out that, you know, you have what is called a hidden history. And, you know, w you know, let, let, you know let's, let's dive into some content because we, 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 we could ramble about this literally all day. But I want to dive into some content and get into some good stuff today. So first thing I'm going to do is I am going to read that quote that was mentioned earlier. Okay, and I think many of you would have heard this quote before, but I think it's definitely worthwhile reading um, so that everyone becomes familiar with this. So let me find this quote. Do, 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 do. Um, boom, 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 boom. Here it is. Okay, so observations concerning the increase of mankind. Okay, I'm going to zoom in a bit here so everyone can follow along. And this is written by Benjamin Franklin. Um, this quote was surprising to me, firstly because um, I didn't know that Benjamin Franklin was a raging racist. <laughs> like proper raging racist. It's amazing how many of the, the great forefathers that they expect us to respect and to love and to forgive, you know, over in the UK, Winston Churchill, oh, we're supposed to love him, we're supposed to respect him, we're supposed to worship the ground he walks and the guy's a piece of S-H-I-T, <laughs> proper disgusting racist. So it's really important that we do not hold to esteem their their forefathers and their, the people that they respect because their forefathers and the people that they respect are literally our Hitlers. <laughs> That's what they are. They're like, they want us to worship. It's like asking a Jew to worship Hitler. That's what literally they ask us to do in worshiping their forefathers. These were people responsible for genocide, the architects of it and often the proprietors of it as well. Big shout out to Black Rampage 2. Thank you very much for your generous donation of $19.99. I appreciate it, my brother. Yes. Okay, so let's get into this quote from the raging psychopath, Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> and it's right at the very bottom of this letter. So he wrote this letter and this is the the bottom quote. And by the way, this is founders.archives.gov. Okay, this is some Mickey Mouse website. This is an official government website. Okay, so this is an archive document. In case anyone wants to doubt, this is what was actually said. So let's let's read. So Benjamin Franklin here is. In fact, I'm just going to read the paragraph before to give you guys a bit of context, and then we're going to get into the same. Okay. All right. So, and since detachments of English from Britain sent to America will have their places at home, so soon supplied and increase so largely here, why should the Palatine Boers be suffered to swarm into our settlements and by herding together establish their language and manners to the exclusion of ours. Why should Pennsylvania, founded by the English, become a colony of aliens who will shortly be so numerous as to Germanize us? Quote, notice that word, Germanize us. Why would he be worried about the Germans? You're going to find out. Instead of Anglified, instead of us, Anglify in them and will never adopt our language or customs any more than they can acquire our complexion. Okay, so this is the discussion about complexion. So for those of you who like to jump on the, oh, they were describing hair color. <laughs> yeah, no, they weren't. Okay, very, very clear. So what was he talking about here? Which leads me to add one remark that the number of purely white people in the world is proportionally proportionably very small all africa is black or tawny okay so all africa is black or tawny tawny being that kind of brown color okay or black so this is your brown and black alternating asia chiefly tawny okay so asia is chiefly brown america exclusive of the newcomers so the newcomers being the westerners obviously wholly so so america's wholly brown okay so wholly the color of half of africa essentially and in europe the spaniards 
Italians, French, Russians, and Swedes. And I love the fact that Sweden's in here as well, <laughs> in case there's any doubt, are generally of what we call a swarthy complexion, as are the Germans also. The Saxons only ex accepted who with the English make up the principal body of white people on the face of the earth. So white people basically he's saying are restricted to the Saxons and the English and everyone else, well Spaniards, Italians, French, Russians, Swedes and Germans are principally swarthy. Now there's a few things we need to do before we dive in any further because there's going to be people with their kind of doubting Thomas hats out which is fair enough let's define the word swarthy so I love my 1827 dictionary because this is only 70 years out from this quote being written by Benjamin Franklin so it's almost contemporaneous I hope you would agree okay and I'm going to give you the definition of the word swarthy in accordance to my 1827 Collins Dictionary. So let me read this to you. <clears throat> if I can find it, here we go. So, 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 here we go. Swiss word. Swarm, swarthy. So definition of swarthy is dark of complexion and it says tawny there. So tawny is the color that he used to describe half of Africa. And actually I've got another definition for that which we're gonna see in the longer version of this dictionary. In fact, I can pull it up on the screen because I've got it saved, bear with me. Tracy, thank you very much for your generous donation. She says, the power of lies to shape perception is magnified when they are repeated incessantly over centuries, gradually cementing themselves as accepted truths in the collective consciousness, lies repeated. Absolutely, absolutely. So I'm gonna find the quote for you really quickly. I think, I, yeah, here it is. And I'm gonna pull it up on the screen so you can see this as well. Let me rotate this one, let me rotate from here. Let me rotate, so I'm just gonna figure out if I can rotate this image, otherwise I'll have to, let me save it instead. Okay. Sorry guys, bear with me one second. Let me just quickly save the image as, and I'll double click on the screen so I can then open up here. Boom. Okay, it should open up on the screen now. Here we go. So here it is. This is of the same 1827 dictionary, but this is the full version that I got when I went to the British Library. So I'm just gonna rotate the screen so you can all see this. Here we go. Let's zoom in, swarthy, dark of complexion, black, dusky, tawny, okay? The swarthy Africans complain. Though through torrid climates, the common color is black or swarthy, yet the natural color of the temperate climates is more transparent and beautiful. Here, Swarthy Charles appears, and that's, we're gonna get into that one. Swarthy Charles, yeah. And there, his brother with de with de with dejected air, okay. I'm sure a lot of people wanna get into Swarthy Ch Charles. Swarthy, to Swarthy, to blacken, to make Swarthy or Dusky. So Swarthy is clearly a word that is associated with darkness or blackness, okay. And 
you have Benjamin Franklin here saying essentially all of Germany or principally Germany swarvy. Now that by itself is, I wouldn't say it's a nothing burger, but it's kind of like, mm, we clearly got it wrong. But then when we think about the thing, the people that he mentioned, let's just do uh, do this really logically, okay? Just have less of a, a real logical kind of like look at this. Cause I'm sure you guys even being in America, why is that just crushed on me? Blimey, tell you man. When um, Google Chrome wants to start crashing, it just goes, it goes off on one, doesn't it? Okay, that's not gonna work. Okay, I'll do a new window here. So let's just do really quickly a search for Swedish people. And I know this is gonna seem really simple. You're like, Andrew, you know what Swedish people look like, but it's quite important to know. Swedish people now, the Swedes, as Benjamin Franklin mentioned, even if you're gonna use the really, really, a really, really far-fetched definition of swarthy and say, okay, he, he maybe he means just like a little bit on the olive side, <laughs> have that word olive, you know, like, you know, Italians and modern Spaniards, they're a bit brown. Swedish people aren't that. They are what you would describe now as the Nordic race. They are whiter than the Brits and the Saxon, or at least the modern Brits, certainly whiter than modern Brits by some degree. Okay, they're, they're known for being a mainly kind of light haired kind of people with very, very light skin. The same thing we know of Germans and Dutch. And yet these people were called principally swarthy. So by itself, it feels like it's nothing. But then when you add it together with the fact that these people couldn't have been confusing these people with being principally a dark skinned people, because they weren't. If you look at Germans, um, Austrians, Dutch and British now, they're probably the most contiguous racial, race, racially on the European continent. They all look very, very alike. It's very hard to tell a Dutch person apart from a British person, but obviously apart from when they start speaking. They look really similar. And I can't, I wouldn't say that for all kind of Europeans. I can tend to tell Eastern Europeans apart from Western Europeans, even when they're the same complexion. There's just something about the kind of facial structure and makeup. But when it comes to Austrians, um, Dutch, English, they all look very, very similar. They're obviously of the same stock. So then the question asks, well, what what happened to these swarthy people? Where where have they gone? <laughs> because that tapestry would suggest that these were the people that Benjamin Franklin was talking about. These people here that were hunted into disappearance what happened to them and when did it happen that is the question isn't it okay that is the question let's have a look at a um video now we've well, actually no, i will have finished reading this quote i only got halfway <laughs> wait i'm sure i didn't get to the end um swarthy complexion um as are the germans also the saxons only accepted with the who with the english make the principal body of white people on the face of the earth i wish i could i wish their numbers were increased and um, while we are, as I may call it, scouring our planet by clearing America of woods and so making this side of our globe reflect a brighter light to the eyes of inhabitants in Mars or Venus, why should we let, why should we in the sight of superior beings darken its people? So he was really on one here, man, that, that, that whole evolution theory had, had got him on one <laughs> for aliens were watching him. Why increase the sons of Africa? by planting them in America, where we have so fair an opportunity by excluding all blacks and tawnies, all blacks and browns, of increasing the lovely white and red, but perhaps I am partial to the complexion of my country, for such kind of partiality is natural to mankind. So there you have it, there's the, um, the, the <laughs> quote unquote great Benjamin Franklin. What a, what a patriarch we have there. Okay, let's have a quick breeze through this video that I did. It's a very short video, it's about two minutes long. Okay, I'm just gonna quickly change my view because I don't want this to be full screen. So let me, um, boom, boom.
Okay, cool. So I want to watch this video together with you guys. I'm going to full screen it. Okay. And yeah, some of you would have seen this. Some of you haven't, but pay attention. It's quite interesting. And um, I may jump in, but I may not because it's really short. But yeah, let me let it play. Have you ever wondered why Morris dancers dress in blackface? Well, the modern explanation is as follows. Back in the 1400s, which is where it's the earliest recorded uh, events are, uh, during the winter they would put rags on their jackets, maybe put bells on, disguise their faces, normally with soot from the chimney and some grease, They're and predate any racial connotations. As entertaining as that. Now, just a really quick one. For those of you who aren't English, Morris dancing is kind of like a thing. It's like called folk dancing over here. Not all Morris dancers do the blackface thing, but I had no idea that Morris dancing's origins came from the came from the Moors. So this was quite interesting for me to learn. But one of the reasons I like to play back this video is just so we can look at some of these dictionary definitions, because that's what's really key here. So let me let it play explanation is it is as dishonest as it is convoluted. Let's qualify that by looking up some of the earliest definitions available in this dictionary of the English language by Samuel Johnson dated 1827. It states for the definition of Morisque a dance after the manner of the Moors often written Maurice or Morris also a dancer of Morris or Moorish dance. In the same dictionary, the definition of Moorish means belonging to the Moors, whilst Mooresque means done after the manner of the Moors. And just in case there is any controversy regarding the definition of Moor, the definition for this is a nice... So just to be clear, that little picture that was up that I put across through, that came from a guy called Ancestral Brew who has... He's one of these... He's really irritating. I can't stand the guy, if I'm going to be totally honest with you. Um, don't leave hate on this channel, by the way. I know you wouldn't, but I'll just say that just to be PC. Um, yeah, I can't stand the guy because all of his videos are so... Um, he's always trying to steal black achievements and black history and then kind of like give it to Arabs or anybody else. And then he makes up... I've done a video on him before. He makes up um, all of this genetic information. He does this kind of like quasi-interpretation of genetic data and he's done it on the moors as well so he talks about how he just you can see that the image there he's painted the moors to be these kind of like light colored arabs it's like mate the word the word literally <laughs> the definition of the word is here it clearly means a negro and you're trying to steal our european history and it's not on and we must um yeah we must essentially start taking a little bit more being a bit more forthright and confrontational about people trying to steal and erase our presence on the continent because actually yes african history is really important but if we have a history in europe as well that is equally something that we need to start placing our resources and our weight towards understanding because it, it, it's significant <laughs> our imprint on this continent is significant but yeah let me play a play niger a negro a blackamoor Shakespeare states, getting up off the Negro's belly, the moor is with child by you. Also in as early as 1489, William Caxton states, he was so angry, he became as black as a moor. Miranda Kaufman states that Shakespeare described Othello and Aaron of Titus Andronicus as moors, but references to Othello's sooty bosom and Aaron's coal black visage make it clear that both were conceived as being dark skinned. Henry Peacham's drawing of a staging of Titus Andronicus confirms that Aaron was played as a black man. Indeed, the earliest available interpretations of Morris or Moresca dancing leave little room for semantic ambiguity as seen in this 1480 statue of an original dancing moor from Bavaria proving the Moresca tradition was one that was widespread throughout Europe. So, so this is really quite key because the Moorish dancers keep the same costume as well, which I find quite interesting. And actually, there are many things that we associate with kind of like European and English folk tradition that relate directly to the Moors. A lot of it is Moorish tradition, even a lot of these outfits that in our minds are so kind of like European, but you, you guys saw, yeah, you guys did see on that tapestry that I showed you the wild men and the moors, the wild men didn't have clothes. 
the Moors were clothed. The crown, those crowns that we associate with European monarchs were formed by the Moors before Europe had monarchies. So it calls into question, asks us to revise our entire understanding about where a lot of these things originated. Where did these trends, these clothings, these fashions originate? Where did they, who do they look like? You know, the more and more I kind of do this research, the more I kind of look back. And when I look at period dramas and I see people kind of like sometimes European people wearing certain clothes, it looks like cosplay to me. So like, why does it look like cosplay? But then, you know, if that would be someone, you know, Moorish or of African descent wearing that, it would look more natural. It's really weird how this is now crossing over even into some of the traditions that are associated with Europe. But yeah. So should blackface be banned and should people be offended? Perhaps the greater concern is what seems to be the deliberate omission of the black European contribution toward this culturally significant tradition. Indeed, rather than ignoring or burying this tradition, we should allow it to open up an important and honest discourse about the influential pre-transatlantic presence of black people on the European continent. So, yeah, one of the main reasons I did that video is not to... I don't know. Um, yeah, one of the main reasons I did that video was not to get people to start attacking Morris Dance and I'm sure you guys got. It's about exposing the truth behind some of these traditions. It kind of like Morris Dance and I now want it to flourish. I want it to exist and I want everyone to know what Morris Dancing is. I hope Morris Dancing becomes massive and <laughs> they start doing it everywhere because then it forces the door to be open on that conversation. And it forces people to, know, to have that conversation. Hey, do you know where Morris dancing comes from? You know, Morris means Moorish. And you know that we took this dance from black Europeans. <laughs> that's a that's a big conversation to have, you know, um, especially since all of these, many of these traditions, Morris dancing is, as well, you know, once again, dates back to the 1400s. It predates any idea of slavery. So you can't blame slaves for being the kind of like proprietors of that tradition it's very interesting okay so on that note we are 45 minutes in and i want to start the video i'm going to have a quick look at um the chat see if i'm missing anything in particular see if i'm missing any donations because i've been historically very bad at that but i don't <laughs> i'm doing okay at the moment um yeah let's have a look hit the likes up by the way while i'm doing this this is an interesting point wildflowers made here um said they now use swarvy to speak about italians yes they do absolutely just like they use brunette we looked i don't know if you guys were on my live stream the other day and the word brunette means brown complexion okay complexion it means you have brown skin so if someone was called a brunette that's what we would call in modern days someone who's caramel skinned that's what a brunette means. So oh, she's a brunette. That means that's a caramel skinned person. Maybe someone sitting between caramel skin skinned and what we in the black community call light skinned. That's what brunette means. Now it means brown hair. Historically, it never meant brown hair. So it's amazing how these words augment. And that's how we even got into that entire discussion with Metatron about the word olive. Because my gut feeling is that when olive when they first started using the word olive it was probably to describe people who were literally brown skinned colored, colored like olives but it changes over time and they find a way to make it fit the population that was being spoken about so it's probably inconvenient if you've got all of these english people being called brunette rather than bury the word or stop using it it's better that you augment and change its meaning which is what they do a lot of the time so that's a very good point do, 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 doom. Just having a quick read through. Do, 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 do. Doesn't look like as much. I mean, you guys having a good chat there, which is nice to see. But I don't think I need to jump on anything else. Thanks, Kapruki. Kapruki's here, by the way, the uh, um, author of the work of the content we're about to look into, and he's doing some good cleanup work as well. So hit up some likes, okay? 
Show Kapuki some love by hitting up likes for the stream. And let's have a look. Let's dive into his very excellent content. So this is video number one. I'm, I've got to try not to interrupt it too much. This is a two part video. And I think we got 24 minutes on the first and 27 minutes on the second. So I'm going to try not to interrupt it. Now, I'm, I'm not going to promise that I'm not going to interrupt it at all. Because sometimes I do these live streams and then people hit in the comments like, dude, man, you keep interrupting the video let me if you want to watch the video just just go to the video for god's sake this is a reaction okay so this is not going to be a straight playthrough all right it's going to be a reaction but i'm going to pop the video link in the chat if you're not subscribed to kapruki then really what are you doing is what i'm going to say but don't go away and watch this video now watch it afterwards because you can watch it with me at the moment and we'll have a good chat about it but if you're not subscribed to Kapruki's channel, then yeah, like I said, what are you doing? Like it's it's a brilliant, brilliant channel. And let's get into it. I'd like us to begin by trying to overcome our ideas and see history for what it is. I think this is the key point. So so much of what we understand about history or our ideas about history aren't just bound up in the evidence of that history, but also in our emotions. We form an emotional attachment to moments in history, to narratives in history, to people in history. And those emotional narratives then bind us to an idea about history that may not be supported by evidence. And then we look for the evidence that supports our narrative, rather than allowing the evidence to drive our narrative. Rolls of arms. I'm just going to pause it there really quickly. That guy speaking there is a guy called Dr. Onyeka Nubia. And actually, I think Kapruki's in direct contact with him. So I'm going to try and get him on the channel. So, yeah, that would be a very interesting um, guest to have on there. And I just want to say a big thank you to Sir Perchant, who said thank you for, thank you and your mods. I don't thank my mods enough. Thank you guys for doing this. When they come in here trying to derail your stream, you know you're doing something right. Yeah. I mean, if you think ancient Kemet was a war ground, <laughs> you better strap your boots on because, yeah, Europe is going to be a mad one. But you know what? I relish I relish this, um, the coming weeks and months when we expose more and more of our history on the continent. Armorials, or as they're known in German, Wappenbuchs, Wappen meaning coat of arms, Buch meaning book, are collections of coats of arms usually consisting of rows of painted pictures or shields, each shield accompanied by the name of the person bearing the arms. Medieval arms might usually include a few hundred coats of arms, and in the late medieval period, sometimes up to 2000, produced as explained in an e dictionary of heraldry 1987 on occasions relating to specific events such as tournaments or on a regional basis collecting the arms of the nobility of a given region with the aim of encyclopedic collection much like a census. The German Gelroy Armorial is just one of these rolls of arms compiled in the years prior to its eventual production in 1396 by Klaus Heinenzoon, a herald in the service of the Duke of Gelders. Gelders being a historical region of the German Holy Roman Empire and displaying some 1,800 in colour coats of arms from all over Europe and is one of the most important sources to date for the study of medieval heraldry. A brief skim over its some 260 pages, accessible in its digitally archived state, will present you with vibrant and attractive illustrations of every style one could imagine adorning a shield. However, it might also leave one who's minimally read in Middle Ages and early modern period European history somewhat caught off guard, not by the sheer number of illustrations that its compilers laboured through, nor in the difficulty in reading the names adorning each arms, but by black people, or in terms appropriate to the time period and not up modern. And this was, you know what was really wonderful about this, because I do have a few of these coats of arms accessible but not as not the the kind of catalog that he's put on this video which is you know truly amazing i've got a book called nature knows no color lines by j a rogers by the way if you haven't got that book and this subject interests you then i would definitely advise you to purchase that book it's called nature knows no color lines um i'm sure someone could put the name of that in the chat you can buy it from amazon it is a excellent book and will really open your eyes to this subject but i remember just a few years back maybe like a yeah maybe like a decade back 
I only knew of one single kind of like Moorish flag with the four heads of the four black moors on it and that was it and it's like in the last it's been amazing because in the last like few years particularly in the last to be honest with you last two to three years it's been amazing to find out how many of these coats of arms exist and how many of them bear the heads of the black founders on them i mean even this one where i've paused it it's got the feather of ma'at on their hair because there is that very close link to Kemet as well. There's constant references to Egypt for this native black population as well. So it's really interesting. Um, and you know, the excuses they make about the, you know, these were the, the people they vanquished, just like, doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. Why would you have the head of your enemy as your coat of arms? Doesn't make any sense. But um, yeah, let me let it play. Modern post-colonial notions of ethnicity, Moors. Moorish iconography is so abundant throughout this armorial that of the 117 European coats of arms bearing exposed human faces, I counted a whole 41 bearing the faces of Swahili Negroes, with a not much greater 45 bearing the faces of Caucasians. This count excludes human faces coloured in red, blue, grey, uncoloured faces, and others that, well, deserve a category unto themselves. So basically, it excluded a load of other black faces there. Yeah, just bear that in mind, yeah, to be politically correct. That's why one of the reasons why I love his videos, because he's very subtle with this. He's like, look, I'm only going to count the ones that are coloured in black, even though you idiots can clearly see that these blue and clear faces with Afro hair and big lips are also black people. But for the benefit, for your benefit, I'm not going to include those in this count. Amazing. Um, and someone just mentioned it is the flag of Sardinia, which is correct. That's the one I was talking about with the four black faces on it. I was like, oh, you know, first seeing this flag, let me just quickly pop up on the screen. This was years ago. And this is all I knew about Moorish presence. But even that was enough to say, hey, that's a bit weird. Why have they got black people all up, all up on the flag? Don't make any sense. And um, especially since if these people were the enemy, why would you put them on your flag? You don't put your enemy on your flag. It don't make no sense. Yeah. We're not getting the full picture, are we? This is now starting to paint the picture, the full picture of what's going on. This count also excludes from the categories of Moorish and Caucasian, the eight counted faces that exhibit pale skin with the characteristic Negroid features displayed on the crest, albeit often presented in conjunction with Negro depictions. A decision hinging on the fact that before we continue an exploration into this armorial, it's important that we establish what a more even is, and what that term has to do with black people. The relation can be summed up quite simply. The vast majority of the Moors were black people, or at least what we would by our modern standards call black people, even though that term is an outdated European colonial paradigm, and far from the terms that will have been used to distinguish those features during the days of the Moors. Evidence to that claim on the Moors' ethnic identity will be presented, but firstly, understanding the history of those people and the climate in which they arose is paramount before questions of ethnicity are discussed. The Moors were largely African Muslims, converted to the faith during the Arab conquest of North Africa, causing many Africans indigenous to North Africa to flee to the land south of the Sahara, whilst those remained were converted to Islam. The importance of this Arab conquest is often understated, largely because of the lasting impact it had beyond North Africa. Whilst the Arabs claimed Egypt in 639 CE, Tripoli in 643 CE, and southwest Morocco in 681 CE, it's duly important to recognise that they were conquering these territories from the Romans during the waning periods of the Roman Empire's history. A significant fact, because north of North Africa, in Europe, it was the Roman Empire that carried the torch of civilization. A flame extinguished by the dissolution of the Empire in North Africa and subsequent fall of the Western Roman Empire in approximately 500 CE, plunging Europe into a miserable economic, intellectual and cultural decline, a period known as the Dark Ages. The Dark Ages lasted until... Now it's important to note that historically when we talk about the Dark Ages and the fall of the Roman Empire on the European continent, we are talking about the rise of the Visigoths, essentially the Vandals and the Goths who were responsible for the overthrow of the Romans on the European continent, at least that's what we're taught, okay? So you have this Visigothic, you know, uprising, which was responsible for the fall of the Roman Empire. This is what we're taught by book. And then 
200 years later, we have an invading force from quote unquote North Africa, um, which comes and subdues the Visigoths. And then they're in charge for several hundreds of years. We're talking about 800 years or so before they're fully overthrown. Obviously, we know the Crusades spanned about 400 years, according to, you know, if we look at the the text, they, the Crusades started around 1100 AD and concluded around just before 1500 AD. So around 400 years of Crusades, quote unquote, were taking place before the overthrow. And then at that point, it was kind of like, oh yeah, and then we told, we pushed the Moors back into, into North Africa. Now, <laughs> here's the problem with that story, okay? First of all, who after 800 years is going to have any connection with the land of their origin? <laughs> and you can't call these people African at this stage, yeah? After even 100 years, you may as well call those people Europeans because that's all they've known. Okay, so these people are no longer African at this stage. They're just black Europeans. Okay, they're Europeans. Or, and who's to even suggest that they had a, you know, were not fully integrated. And this is going by the book. This is putting aside the fact that I believe many of these people were indigenous. I'm going to put that aside. Even going by the book, there's so many things that don't make sense in terms of the way the Crusades took place. And another thing that I do like to push is the fact that Reconquista, what it's called now, that term was invented in the 19th century, okay? That was propaganda. Before then, it was just called the Crusades. And I thoroughly believe they didn't have this story of a Moorish invasion until they decided to re-establish it as a Reconquista or Reconquest. We were taken back what was originally ours 800 years ago. <laughs> it wasn't that. It's nothing to do with that. It was crusades. That's what it was called. We are taking what belongs to the Moors. Okay. We're going to take it for ourselves. That's what it was called before the Christian crusades. Okay. But over time it's become, or at least in the 19th century, with the rise of racism, it becomes the reconquista. Oh yeah. We need a story to go with that. Oh yeah. Let's, uh, let's, let's talk about an invasion that took place on the European continent. That's where all these black people came from. Do you see how these things are twisted? the eventual European Renaissance in the 14th century, and is a period often glossed over in the history books, as illustrated by anthropologist Robert Briffalt in his book Rational Evolution, 1930, page 109 to 11. From the 5th to the 10th century, Europe lay slunk in a night of barbarism, more awful and horrible than that of the primitive savage, for it was the decomposing body of what had been a great civilization. Cities had practically disappeared, they were pulled down and used as quarries to build towers in which a bishop or a baron established himself who could afford such protection. In Nimes, for example, the remains of the population dwelt in huts built among the ruins of the amphitheatre. Other towns were completely abandoned. Famines and plagues were chronic. There were 10 devastating famines and 13 plagues in the course of the 10th century alone. Cases of cannibalism were not uncommon. There were manhunts, not with the view of plunder, but for food. It is on record that at Tornus on the Sound, human flesh was publicly put up for sale. Similar insights are echoed in the writings of medieval historian Joseph McCabe. In the so, as I'm listening to this and seeing those images, isn't this giving you kind of... Um, isn't this kind of like bringing to resemblance what we spoke about at the start of the stream with the wild men? Yeah, isn't, isn't that what's coming to mind? So I, what I'm picturing here is an invasion of wild men on the European continent. Okay, so this is an invasion of wild men on the European continent. And this sounds like wild men type behavior, the kind of behavior that would have been taking place in certain parts of the European continent. It's very interesting. Just, yeah, it's just very interesting. Because literally, as I saw those images, they're not very far from the images that we saw that were on the tapestry. So clearly there's some kind of acknowledgement. Um, big shout out to the Milan messenger who says, do you know who is considered brunette? Eleanor of Aquitaine is called brunette. If you look at her tomb effigy, you will see, still see the dark brown paint. I was not aware, but I am now. 
and I'm really grateful because <laughs> I'm going to check that out. So thank you very much for your generous donation and your input. Fantastic. The New Science in the Story of Evolution, 1931, page 298. None of our modern sophistry redeems the squalor of Europe from the 5th to the 11th century. By the year 1000, Europe was reduced to a condition which if we were not Europeans, we should frankly call barbarism. Yet at that time, the Arabs, the Moors, had a splendid civilization in Spain, Sicily, Egypt and Persia, and it linked on to those of India and China. We write manuals of the history of Europe or the Middle Ages, and we confine ourselves to a small squalid area, Russia and Prussia not yet being civilized and Spain being Moorish, and ignore the brilliant civilization that ran from Portugal to the China Sea. This was the climate of chaos and squalor that reigned in Europe, meanwhile the Arabs, with North Africa now under their full control, appointed the Yemeni Musa ibn Nusay as governor of North Africa. An appointment that would set a precedent for the overwhelmingly black African invasion of Europe, launching off the pedestal of an Arab-initiated but not population representative regime in North Africa. The governor Musa had already set his eyes on Spain, ruled at the time by the Christian German Visigoths after seizing it from the ailing Romans. However, Musa feared that an attack against the Visigoths would exhaust his armies, especially when having to bypass the fortress of Ceuta, located on the northern tip of Morocco and mastered by Count Julian, allied to the Visigothic ruler of Spain, King Roderick, and guarding his lands from Arab attacks. However, due to Roderick's apparent taking advantage of Julian's daughter at his Toledo court, the Count switched sides, throwing in his lot with Musa, who sent a reconnaissance mission of 500 African troops into Spain, led by fellow African Tariq ibn Ziyad, otherwise known as Tariq al-Gibral, after which the famous Rock of Gibraltar is named, plundering Algericus after landing at the port, today known as Tarifa, named by the invading forces Tarif, after the success of the mission and their leader. A port at which it also stands to note, the Moors later imposed a special tax which we now refer to as the Tariff. The following year, Tariq led a force of 6,700 Moorish and Berber African soldiers into Spain, occupying Montscalp, building a fortress and renaming the region Gebel Tariq, meaning hill or rock of Tariq, which the Spanish later called Gibraltar. It was the success of this mission that sent one clear message back to North Africa. Europe was ripe for conquest. Subsequently, Tariq went on to lead his men against the cities of Algedicus and Cartea, during which thousands of Spaniards flocked to his banner against the German Visigothic rulers. And on the 18th of July 711 CE, Tariq's 14,000 troops defeated a force of 60,000 led by King Roderick. With that major victory lending to their fervor, Tariq and his men swept across the country, seizing Archidona, Cordova, Efija, Elvira, Murcia and Orihuela, and the capital city, Toledo, in a spirit of terrifying conquest that a European writer of the time, sympathetic to the Spaniards, recounted as referenced in Professor Scobie's The Moors and Portugal's Global Expansion in the Golden Age of the Moor, page three. This is an excellent, excellent retelling um, done here by um, Kapruki. Like I said earlier, I am very skeptical of the story. I think the the time span for the Moorish conquest of mainland Europe was four to seven years, which just seems like an impossibly, it feels like one of those possibly fast and convoluted time spans that's put in place to make a story fit, fit within a space of time as quickly as possible. Me personally, I don't buy it. Um, <laughs> The more I research this, no pun intended, the more I research this, the more I lean towards the idea that actually what we what we what we saw in lots of Europe was conversion, conversion to Islam, like similar to what we saw in Africa, conversion to Islam of the native black population that was already there. Um, and actually the invasion that was taking place was the invasion of the Visigoths that was the invasion that was taking place it's really yeah it's, it's it's a it's a complex um complex picture but that's just my perspective and I'm not going to interrupt this again for a bit 336 the reins of their horses were as fire their faces black as pitch their eyes shone like burning candles their horses were swift as leopards and the riders fiercer than a wolf in a sheepfold at night the noble goths were broken in an hour quicker than tongue can tell Luckless Spain. 
These were the series of African-led campaigns that commenced Moorish domination in Europe, and while it may have been the North African governor Musa, who according to Professor C.P. Groves was taken aback by the speed of events upon hearing of Tariq's victories, that mobilized an army of 18,000 Arabs and Africans to complete the conquest of Carmona, Cremona, Medina and Sigona, and thus associating the Arab arms with the final victory. It was Tariq's army that supplied with reinforcements by Musa, finally defeated King Roderick in battle at the mountain range of Seguyuela, killing the Visigothic king in the process and commencing an influx of Africans into Spain by the thousands. As expressed, if somewhat exaggerated, in Bronson and Rashidi's The Moors in Antiquity, in the Golden Age of the Moor, page 55, stating that so eager were they to come that some are said to have floated over on tree trunks. It was the swelling of Moorish civilization with this largely indigenous black African populace that served as the militant fuel for Moorish domination across the southern European landscape. Elucidated by a study in the 1992 edition of the Journal of Human Biology entitled Importation Route of the Sickle Cell Trait into Portugal, Contributions of Molecular Epidemiology, the abstract of which can be read as follows. To elucidate the origin and spread of the sickle cell trait into the Portuguese population, we examined nine polymorphic DNA markers within the beta globin gene cluster defining the haplotype. The population sample included 64 sickle cell gene bearing individuals from defined Portuguese speaking white, black and Asian Indian populations. The nature and geographic distribution of the different beta S haplogroups in Portugal suggests that the sickle cell trait has been imported twice. Between the 8th and 13th centuries of the Mediterranean Basin, in association with the Benin haplotype, coinciding with Moorish occupation, and after the 15th century from Africa. So just really important to note there, okay? The one imported between the 8th and the 13th century is consistent with the Benin haplotype, okay? And just bear in mind what I said about the Moors being of West African descent because that's something that's missed. So it's really good that you picked that up here. Africa over an Atlantic route associated with the Senegal and Bantu haplotypes coinciding with the transatlantic slave trade. Robin Walker concisely sums up the implications of these findings. There are a number of different sickle cell haplotypes. Among them are the Benin haplotype, the Senegalese haplotype, the Asian and Arab haplotype, etc. Had the Islamic culture been predominantly Arab, it would have been the Asian and Arab haplotype that would have been introduced into Portuguese populations between the 8th and 13th centuries, and not the Benin haplotype. Furthermore, the researchers have been able to... Dis also, just to um, kind of expand, the there is a long hidden history between West Africa and Portugal that goes back several, several centuries. Um, many of you will probably be familiar with an island called Sao Tome, where the which is literally just off the coast of West Africa, so it lies just below kind of like Nigeria and Ghana. It's an island, and the language there is spoken there is Portuguese, and they'll tell you, oh yeah, it's because it was caught, um, because it was uh, colonized by the Portuguese. Like no, the language there, the main language is Portuguese, and the reason why is because this is where Portugal exported their um, exiled Jews, <laughs> for want of a better word, okay? Um, they exported their exiled black Jews and others, but essentially a lot of exiled black Moors, okay, of Jew, Jewish and Christian descent um, were exported to the island of Sao Tome. So that's a what you see in Sao Tome is a indigenous Portuguese population that were essentially kicked out of that nation. Um, I'm not going to go into massive detail about that, um, but there's another YouTuber called Dante Forston, I believe, who has some very detailed, um, very detailed text regarding this and research that he's done. Um, I've just consumed it. I didn't do this research myself, um, but he's done a, an excellent job in breaking this down and breaking down the kind of edicts and the, that came from the King of Portugal um, that basically yeah, resulted in a huge amount. And we're talking about, I think in one time there was around, I think the, the number is estimated to be between half a million, 800,000 Moorish Portuguese exported to the island of Sao Tome. And this is w where a lot of the slave trade was kicked off 
from um, essentially kidnapping those populations and taking them to the new world. So, yeah, it's very interesting um, because there's a long history of not just trade, even even today on my Discord, um, one of my um, members, Wesco, actually, who's here, one of the moderators, he was sharing in the Benin group, the um, Benin bronzes, many of the depictions on the Benin bronzes are depictions of Europeans, black Europeans. So you can see they have completely different physical um, clothing and wear. They're wearing, but they're wearing notably Portuguese armor and notably Portuguese gear. I actually just replied to him today to let him know these are, these are definitely Portuguese. And I remember actually specifically one, um, I think it was, it's an ivory, I can't remember if it was a salt cellar or something like that, a stand. And it has, and it's in the British Museum because I've seen it, I've taken a photo and it has four Portuguese people in it. It's a Benin artifact and it predates, like I said, Transatlantia. These are, you know, 14th, 15th century artifacts. Um, and they show a trading history and a history of exchange. So there's something that went on between that area of Africa, Benin, West Africa, and the Moorish empires. There was clearly some kind of unbroken, you know, line of communication that went back and forth between those two regions. So it's just interesting to note when he pointed out that the, specifically the Benin haplotype was the one that was found there. Distinguished between the sickle cell imported after the 15th century from the sickle cell imported between the 8th and the 13th centuries. This separates the sickle cell introduced by enslaved Africans from that introduced by the Moorish African conquerors. This is strong evidence that the majority of the Moors and Berbers were Negroes who carried the Benin haplotype into the Portuguese populations and if they did this in Portugal then they certainly did this in Spain. This is compounded by historian and author Marcus Hatstein, editor of the important modern work on Islamic culture, Spanish Umayyads, history and Islam, art and architecture, in which he states that the Arabs in Spain were mostly southern Arabs and Yemenites people of whom even today many are Negroid and would have been even more so over a thousand years ago prior to the propagation of Caucasian phenotypes in the Turkic Ottoman expansion. Taken with the Africans, we can conclude that the Islamic culture of Spain was largely a Negro achievement. Prof uh, can I just add as well, the, um, it's funny because you have on the Arabian Peninsula, you're just talking about Yemen and Oman, you do have the Habesha type um, blacks because that used to be a part of the Abyssinian Empire. So, and obviously this all predates the Moors and stuff. So these people share a phenotype across from, and, and they also there's that kind of like Semitic link between the um, Southern Arabia and the Horn of Africa. So there's clear kind of like, yeah, phenotypic, these people are, they look physically African, um, but they obviously have the Arabic culture. What's interesting though, is when you go a little bit further north, so if you go to Qatar and the UAE, they also have indigenous black populations, but their indigenous popu black populations are of the West African type. And that's been proven um, through genetics as well. So in Qatar, I think I mentioned before, you're talking about 40% amongst the Qataris, 40% um, West African DNA. Now this isn't spoken about a lot and they try to make this really random excuse about the reason there's West African DNA is because of slavery. But I've mentioned before, Qataris are goat herders, as were the people of the UAE, the Emirates, before they found oil, these these were goat herding populations. They had absolutely no use for slaves and no history. And like I said, they would have had no luck um, winning any kind of war against West Africa in the times that they're trying to claim this. So these people are indigenous groups once again, but they have this close relation with the people who are in modern day West Africa. So it's just really interesting that you, it's not just the, the Yemen and the Oman, it's other parts of the Arabian Peninsula as well, but different flavors of Africa, for want of a better word. It's very interesting. Um, thank you very much to the souls of our ancestors who has um, kindly donated 9.99. I really appreciate you. The Sao Tome piece speaks to why many of us um, AA have ancestral markers in the Iberian Peninsula. I would love to hear you and Dante chop it up. Yeah, he's a very intelligent fella. Um, if it was on that subject, I certainly 
would be further schooling myself <laughs> to equip myself to have a conversation. Um, but yeah, it would be an excellent. I think that would be an excellent chat myself. Yeah, I, li I like I like his approach to um, research. I think he's very excellent. Um, yes, and Wesker's just put a link into the Discord as well. So if you are interested in going a bit deeper, please do please do join. We do talk about quite a lot. Professor Stanley Lane Poole bolsters this notion on page 28 of the story of the Moors in Spain, stating with regards to Moorish civilization that the Berbers were more numerous than the Arabs. A view shared by Professor John G. Jackson on page 189 of the Introduction to African Civilizations that the Arabs were always a minority in the so-called Arab culture of the Middle Ages. And if the modern sources aren't evidence enough, we need only look to the eyewitness accounts of people who saw the Moors with their own eyes. 11th century accounts from the Song of Roland, an epic poem recounting the heroic deeds of Charlemagne in his reconquista against the Moorish invasion of France, states in describing the Moors that He fears not God, the son of Saint Mary, black is that man as molten pitch that seethes, better he loves murder and treachery than to have all the gold of Galicia. We could look to additional quotes that historical commentator Trilblack elucidates in a recent video presentation on the Moors in Europe. Take Isidore of Seville in his Entomology, Chapter 9, Part 2, Paragraph 122, stating that the Medes mingled with those Libyans who lived closest to Spain. Little by little, the Libyans altered the name of these people, in their barbarous tongue calling the Medes Moors, Maurus, although the Moors are named by the Greeks for their colour, the Greeks call black Maurus, and indeed, blasted by blistering heat, the Moors have a countenance of a black colour or by poet Flavius Crisonius Corippus in his works on the Libyan War, in which he states, akin to darkness, its face seemed Moorish, fearful in its black colour. A quote which Trillblack rightly exposes as being translated within modern sources to fearful in its dark colour, detaching the quote's explicit reference to blackness in favour of a falsification that attempts to whitewash Moorish identity as a continuation of modern Arab North African identity. Not unlike similar attempts we observe with regards to another indigenous black African civilization. A little shout out to me there. He also rightly points out this would be a but actually on that point as well just to such a good point that he raised there you know just the it's the subtle shifts Do you remember like i said I'm, I'm going to reference obviously again last week's live stream responding to metatron and how all of the quotes that used the word black became dark all of the quotes that used the word woolly or kinky became curly these are the subtle shifts um i remember when when they first started releasing genetic results this is this was really interesting to me and this is one of the reasons why i quickly kind of like became very skeptical um towards how genetics were being analyzed and i'm glad i did because it allowed me to approach the subject in a, in a much more um skeptical way which allowed me to gather the data that i need to be able to actually be able to see what's taking place when um um these genetic studies are kind of being published but without digressing too much one of the key trends is that i remember all british people who were taking genetic tests and i'm going to find actually some of these old documentaries about genetics because all british people and when i say all i mean all british people who were taking these tests were coming up with african dna all of them every last one of them and we're talking about high percentages and they would call it and they said recent african dna and the excuse was always oh well you know you've got some moorish ancestry and then the moors what moorish ancestry suddenly changed to north african ancestry and north african ancestry suddenly changed to mediterranean ancestry and now most british people who take a dna test come up 100 percent british now how is that <laughs> And this happens across the board, you know, it's, it's the same thing with, um, um, I can't remember which channel I was watching, but it was, I think it was an Italian girl. And she said when her father first took the DNA test, he came up one quarter African and 75% European. But since then they revised their database and now he comes up 100% Sicilian. And it's kind of like, well, how can you be 100% Sicilian? Like what, what, what is your what is your basis here because on the one hand 
they say, oh, we only tell you the modern populations that you're related to. Yeah, just just bear bear with me one moment. I'm going to make a, a good point here. They only tell you the modern populations that you're related to. And so because this guy, he's taking a test, all that, these British people are taking tests in there, lots of British people are coming up with the same kind of balance in genetics, so to speak. They say, oh, yeah, well, this kind of pattern, this kind of signature, we can now call this pattern or signature a British signature. So now we're just going to call you 100% British or like this guy. We're going to ignore the African part because everybody in the country has that 25% African. So we're going to ignore that and it's going to call that a Sicilian signature. But then how comes as African-Americans, I'm not African-American, by the way, but those of you who are African-American who have done the DNA test, why don't you come up as 100% African-American? You don't come up with 5%. How is it African-Americans, their entirety of their DNA comes from somewhere else? <laughs> some of it's from Europe, some of it's from Africa, some of it's from Asia, some of it's from you know, Native American, they, they say that to kind of create a racial separation, whatever it is. How comes none of it's, surely the, you're noting that these people have a similar signature to each other. So there should be some aspect of that DNA that should now be identified of African American. Because if you're gonna identify something as recent as Sicilian, when we know that go back 500 years, almost the same amount of time, everybody in Portugal, Spain, Sicily were probably black, so we know that your presence there is recent. Why do you come up as 100% Spanish or Portuguese as a, you know, as a, you know, as a white Portuguese or a white, you know, or a white Spaniard when we know that prior to 500 years ago, that was a black part of Europe. Yet African-Americans who have been there almost as long in America, no one's come up 100% African-American all of their DNA comes from somewhere else. So this is the thing. All of these DNA tests are based on a narrative. Okay, they're based on a narrative. They don't just test you and say, oh yeah, you're from here. They test you and then they go, okay, well, he's showing this. So this must be a Nigerian marker because we know that all of these people came from these slaves. Or we know that these people came from, none of this is being done in a judicious way. There should either be a rule that you're only comparing to modern populations, okay? Or you're only comparing to this slice or this moment, this time in history. You can't mix the two. And that's exactly what they do, which is why black people globally in the diaspora, Caribbean, America, I think that's why we're so lost and everyone thinks they're flipping Nigerian. <laughs> and there's a reason why I've been collecting your DNA data. You can see I'm going to approach it in a very skeptical way. And I'm not going to be agreeing with it and telling you guys you're all Nigerian because that's not what my personal belief is. But yeah, let me let it play. Definitely unpoetic repetition of the same word by such a famous poet, while simultaneously contradicted by its original Latin description, similarly highlighted in the same video as Cognata tenebris, maura udebator facies nigroque colore horrida. The word for darkness tenebris and black nigroque bearing no phonetic similarity and exposing clear distinctions between the two, which modern Euro-American academia continually attempts to smooth over. Nigroque, a word denoting Ethiopians and Negritians, that is to say Negroes, who according to Roman poet Claudian in his Bello Gildonico, dwell beside the waters of the Gur, most famous of the rivers of Ethiopia, that overflows its banks as if it had been another Nile. Author J. A. Rogers elaborates in his work, Nature Knows No Colour Line, that the gear referred to here is the Nigir or Niger from which Get that book. <laughs> which the term Niger finds its origins. We find similar reluctance posed by modern scholarship in accepting the origins of similar words as relating to black African presence, as in the case of the word more itself. Sentiment which J.A. Rogers further dismantles in the same works, presenting the interchangeable usage of the word Negro and Moor with reference to Sir William Smith in his Dictionary of Greek and Roman Geography. To the Greeks, Romans and Gauls, the Moors were known as the Black People. He adds, the word Mauritania, inhabited by black populations, was later called Negritia. Moor, therefore, was the equivalent of Negro. Concluding finally, that since therefore the Romans invaded Britain, France, Belgium, Germany and other parts of Europe, they undoubtedly took the word more meaning a black people with them. 
evidenced in Shakespearean usage of the word more as a synonym for Negro, i.e. in his famous Othello, amongst other works. Or similarly, in Christopher Marlowe's Lust's Dominion of the Lascivious Queen, written before Shakespeare's Othello the Moor, and also uses Negro and Moor interchangeably several times. A play which deals with the illicit love of Eliasa Prince of Fez with the Queen of Spain, who has a child by him. Passages of the play read as follows. There goes the Moor, he that makes a cockold of the Spanish Queen, that black prince of devils. In the book, he is also called the Negro King and the Soft-Skinned Negro. Sentiment that's echoed in the literature of yet more European writers of the time, to an extent that can perhaps be concluded as symptomatic of a real climate of the age, in which miscegenation between the Moorish conquerors and Europeans was rife, to the anger of some, but obvious fascination of their audiences. After all, we've seen similar sentiments of anger posed against mixing between white and non-white peoples in the relatively recent anti-miscegenation laws of America. Laws which ranged from punishment in the taxing of mixed-race couples to the threatening of life imprisonment and even death by mob violence. The reality is that racial tension in America has always centered around the black male body and specifically the black controlling the black male brute and most importantly keeping him away from white women was often the excuse for many a racist piece of legislation or act of white terrorism. The mythology of sexually violent dangerous black men is why Emmett Till, a 13 year old boy, was murdered or why Tulsa, Black Wall Street was burned to the ground. However, as with many things repressed by the way, Tulsa is one of 400 black towns in America that had that treatment. It's just the only one we got on record. Um, I think I've mentioned before, I have a book called Sundown Towns, which I would advise you to purchase. It's by, one second. Here we go. It's by James Lowen. Okay, I'll put it to the screen here. All right, Sundown Towns. If you haven't got this book and you're American, um, I'd advise you to buy it um, because what it highlights is that there is a trend and actually this is a global trend. So this is actually a really good point just to raise this really quickly. Wherever you see fascism, I used to think fascism was random, i.e. You know, you've got a population of people who theoretically have never met or been in contact with black people but they really hate them so you get this in russia for instance i had a i once had a um i want to say employee but i'm going to say colleague okay who great guy russian guy his mum was virulently racist we used to have a lot we used to have a bit of a laugh about it. i found it funny he said oh my mum hates black people said, why does your mum hate black people she's never met any i don't know for my whole life growing up she really hated black people and I found it bizarre because I was like, it's just, why would you just hate people that you've never met? Like she could choose to hate Chinese or, you know, Indian or anything like that. And it's not like they didn't even really have black people on Russian TV, but there's this almost ancestral hatred that she has towards black people. And then I obviously after doing a bit of research, I started to realize that that kind of hatred which i call fascism when they just literally just really hate <laughs> really really hate as in cannot cohabit with these people it tends to have its roots in communities that got their land from black people so the reason all of these places became sundown towns i.e places that black people are not allowed to be after nine or whatever, whatever rules they have in their sundown towns is because they stole their land and their property from black people. They literally stole it from them with violence, pitchforks, torches, went in there, you know, chased them out, lynched them, and basically moved into a ready-built city. 400 of these, at least. Someone said a 1,000, but I know there's at least 400. All of them with exactly the same backstory as Tulsa. And it's the same thing that we're seeing here with Europe. You saw Benjamin Franklin's quotes. He said, Russia, Germany, blah, blah, blah. The certain places where there you have this, lots of Eastern Europe, real random hatred. And I think the roots are exactly that. I think the roots are, these people will always hate black people because that was what their literal existence was founded on. 
it's really, yeah, it's really, it's quite enlightening. And I thought I'd just raise that one because he mentioned Tulsa. Because, yeah, there's, there's that, that Tulsa story has played itself out over a hundred times, several hundred times um, on the American continent. In American society, this hatred also manifested as a violent sexual taboo. The fear and hatred of the black male body somehow also translated into fascination and fetishization. As stated in Eugenics, Race and Marriage, by the late 1800s, 38 US states had anti-miscegenation statutes. By 1924, the ban on interracial marriage was still in force in 29 states. Which brings us finally back to Europe and our original case in point, the Gale Ray Armorial, and its fascinating abundance of Moorish Negro iconography. It's important to state that this armorial isn't alone in this either. Moorish depictions pepper European heraldry in weapon books from throughout the Middle Ages. Take another German weapon book produced 200 years later, Johann Christoph Sawyer and Franz Russo Gotthard's Formula and Coat of Arms 1597 and its coats of arms rife with Moorish crests, often matching without fault the shield elements of the corresponding families. Similarly echoed in the Book of Messengers of the Brotherhood of St. Christoph of Aalborg, dating to between the 14th and 15th centuries. Or in the armorial of Conrad von Grunenberg, an important burgher and knight and a descendant of a patrician dynasty from Constance, located on Lake Constance in southwestern Germany dating to 1480 i hope you guys are appreciating this research that's been done here <laughs> i really do hope you're appreciating it amazing stuff and depicting and i quote the coats of arms of barons dukes margraves archbishops free cities and towns and orders of knights from throughout germany as well as the royal coats of arms of the kingdoms of europe <laughs> crests that can also be identified outside of rolls of arms. Take that of English politician Colonel Silius Titus of Bushy, captain of Deal Castle and groom to the bedchamber of King Charles II, a man who began his political aspirations by writing a pamphlet entitled Killing No Murder in 16... Did you see there King Charles II really quickly and do you remember what I read in the dictionary about Swarthy Charles? That's in the dictionary, <laughs> yeah? Black as Swarthy Charles was in the 1827 dictionary. You saw that, guys. I've read that to you. Okay? And people will call you crazy when you say, oh, King Charles II, you know, was... Second, the man who <laughs> began his moving. political aspirations by writing a pamphlet entitled Killing No Murder in 1657. A pamphlet that advocated for the assassination of Oliver Cromwell. The same Oliver Cromwell, whose late 15th and early 16th century policy... That guy there, Oliver Cromwell, is a real demon. <laughs> he's, a, he's a real demon, man. I can't, I can't even stress how much he's a demon. Um, he's like the villain in, in a lot of this. But yeah, let me let it play out. ...legalised the destruction of British art on a scale that historian and author Dominic Selwood described in a 2015 article. No one can be sure of the exact figure, but it is estimated that the destruction started and legalised by Cromwell amounted to 97% of the English art then in existence. Statues were hacked down, frescoes were smashed to bits, mosaics were pulverised We're not going to just amount jump over that, guys. I need you all to fathom this. Because this is where it comes, this is where it starts to, this is where we essentially reach fever pitch. Because the, the argument people will always make, oh, whoa, you know what's the what proof do you have of this? You know, where, if there if there was black nobilities, where's all the paintings? Where's all this? Where's all that? And we've only got traces. We do have some of it, but we've only got traces like these coats of arms books, which we're very fortunate that they didn't bring a torch to. We're very fortunate that you know Kapuki's done his research and we're uncovering and we're seeing some of this stuff. But ninety seven percent of English art. Why would you need to destroy that much? Doesn't it feel like, doesn't it feel like deja vu with what's happening in Kemet as well? The amount that's just been, you know, things that are being smashed to bits. What we're left with, what we've been left with that we see as classical, renaissance, this, that and the other. We have 3% <laughs> of what used to be available. So I start thinking about why that other 97%. Now, obviously, there would have been religious reasons for this. There, I'm sure there would have been religious reasons. There would have been some kind of socio-political reasons. But let's not kid ourselves and think that a lot of it wasn't racial. 
because I think that goes goes about beyond a shadow of a doubt that a lot of this was the erasure of black presence because that black presence was associated maybe with something that was at enmity with what Cromwell was doing. Remember they had killed the reigning monarchy, yeah? Cromwell was responsible for the beheading of the king. Why would he then go on to destroy 97% of English art in existence? Wanted to 97% of the English art then in existence. Statues were hacked down, frescoes were smashed to bits, mosaics were pulverized, illuminated manuscripts were shredded, wooden carvings were burned, precious metal work was melted down, shrines were reduced to rubble. This vandalism went way beyond a religious reform. It was a frenzy obliterating the artistic patrimony of centuries of indigenous craftsmanship with an intensity of hatred for imagery and depicting the divine that has strong and resonant parallels today. I'm just going to bring that back there. I know it's fl flashing through quite quickly. Does it rewind if I double tap? No, it doesn't. All I've done is exit it. Um, let me just bring it back really quickly indigenous craftsmanship with an intensity of hatred for imagery and this picture sorry that picture there you didn't see it it was a woman standing up that's in Coburg and the reason I wanted to pause it there is because even now they are actively trying to get that footprint that black footprint removed okay so that's that image that statue you just saw is in Bavaria and the excuse they're using is that oh you know They've got some fake person to pretend that she's Black Lives Matter and she's offended by this statue because it shows black people in an unflattering way. There's nothing unflattering about any of these images. They're coats of arms. In fact, they show black people in regal positions, but they'll say, oh, the features are unflattering. And you know what? I'm going to show you. I'm just going to show you the video because I want you to be aware and hopefully you're smart enough to not fall for this kind of trignology for want of a better word that they put out there they really do try to deceive us so i'm, I'm actually going to show you this video because i think it's actually important that you read it because i'm doing a, a bit of a research piece around this at the moment um is it here One second. Where, where, where are you? Where are you? Is it this one? I really is this one. Ah, oh, I know it's search. You know you're thinking what's the right search term to use there we go boom okay so let me, let me just show you this video really quickly um here we go um i think this is it Thank you, uh, Nayers, who said I can use the arrow keys to move the time bar just a bit. That is immensely useful. <laughs> I'll use that. I appreciate that. Thanks for sharing. I think this is the... Okay, cool. So just watch this video really quickly. Picturesque Coburg in Bavaria. The town's striking coat of arms depicts the so-called... Okay, so there you go. That's the town's coat of arms, Coburg. Or of Coburg. The emblem is now at the same Nothing there's nothing derogatory about this guys, okay? This is simply the town's founder. But let's carry on. Centre of a heated controversy. Opponents call it a symbol of racism, but many residents are mystified. Is there really nothing else to worry about? We've got bigger problems than the Coburg Moor. He's the patron saint of Coburg, and I find this whole discussion out of order. He's never upset anyone. It can stay as it is. 
The crest dates back to the Middle Ages, when black people were often described as Moors. Today, the term is viewed as derogatory, but it's not intended to be demeaning, according to Coburg historian Hubertus Habel. The emblem features Saint Mauritius. So it's interesting, the people of Coburg are absolutely fine having a black patron saint. Absolutely fine. They're absolutely fine with the black heritage they've come from. Let's see black what's happening Christian here. A knight who was martyred and is now commemorated. And by the way, that's not Saint Maurice, okay? This would have been more black nobility, okay? This would have been more black nobility, okay? So this is not Saint Maurice and some of these people, they try to basically um, conflate, you know, you've got a couple of names they're happy with when I just mentioned, oh yeah, it's either Saint Maurice or some other saint. Um, and those are the only people that they mentioned, but this is nothing to do with that. These are black Germans here, okay? Members of the royal family and nobility, kings, rulers. So that image there is the one that was shown. Nothing derogatory about that. I'd say that's quite an accurate <laughs> depiction of a, a black or a tawny German there. Insofern is das Wort meiner Ansicht nach. To that extent, I think the word more is okay. And the representation of a black man as the symbol of Coburg is absolutely fine. It's an expression of esteem and veneration for the saint. That's not a view shared by two young Berliners who've started an online petition against Coburg's coat of arms. Alicia Archie is originally from the area. For her, calling a black man a Moor is no longer acceptable in the light of the Black Lives Matter movement, and especially not a figure with thick lips and a Caribbean-style earring. Caribbean-style earring? <laughs> what? Anyway... That suggests to some that all black people and all Africans look the same, a complete nonsense for a continent where people look totally different from one another. Others find something exotic in it, a ferocity that has to do with savage peoples. It's a racist portrayal that should not be allowed to continue. So guys, just if you're obviously getting this here, this is what you call fake um, outrage here. Okay, this is kind of like, oh no, I'm so offended. This is racist, this, then, the other. Let me tell you something now. I messaged Alicia Archie, I found her on Instagram. I don't even think she, she's got nothing to do with being an activist, this, that and the other. She doesn't do this at all. In fact, she's a model, <laughs> which makes me think that they hired her to do this. I don't think she has even has any idea what they want to do, okay? The people who are behind trying to remove this, and it's not Black Lives Matter movement. This is an attempt once again to scrub black history out. They're trying to get rid of all of the black iconography that exists. And by the way, they did similar things when they, in the UK during the Black Lives Matter movement, they started pulling down statues. And I've started a, I've started to do a bit of research into those statues and what those people in those statues were linked with. And actually them making the excuse that those people were all pulled down because they were linked with slavery is absolutely false. There were different agendas at play there. And it's the same here. This is an agenda. The agenda is we want to get rid of all of these black statues and faces, okay? Because people like us are now researching our history, okay? And understanding the black presence in Europe. It's better if we just get rid of everything. So we're going to come up with some fake reason as to why we need to have these removed. And they hire some random, lightly mixed person, okay? And they say, yeah, you're going to be the face of this, <laughs> okay? You're going to be the face of this and then we're going to use this to kind of like lobby and to raise legislation and to get rid of all of these references to the Coburg Mall and all these black statues, we're going to get rid of them. No one black is asking for these to be removed. No one white is asking for these to be removed. This is an agenda playing out, an agenda all this time. So it's just really important to note when these things are taking place. Um... Yeah, so I just wanted to kind of like highlight that. Oh, and I've just had a donation as well. So thank you to the Milan Messenger. I think that's the second one today. Appreciate you. The same thing they do with pubs in Britain. Yeah, with Charles II, exactly. They say it's racist because his nickname is The Black Boy. Absolutely. 
absolutely we've got pubs called the black boy and this is the thing this is this is the history they don't want to confront the black royals okay they made such a big song and dance when um Anne Boleyn was depicted as black well guess what Anne, Anne Boleyn is described as black yeah Anne Boleyn is described as black not even swarthy Queen Elizabeth is described as swarthy you'll be so surprised when we start to dig deeper in this subject and you realize how far this rabbit hole goes in terms of um black rulers and black nobility um across europe well yeah this is just one of the things they do um house of coburg house of brandenburg even the house of mecklenburg that um queen charlotte was linked to all of these have very traceable black ancestry so it's just yeah this is just this is just a, a big kind of deception that's taken place here um, and they'll try and use it to push legislation to get rid of more black history. The town and by the way, I don't think there's anything wrong with Alicia. I'm sure she's a lovely girl. She just doesn't even know what's going on, if I'm going to be totally honest with you. Well, is irritated by the debate and is not giving any interviews on the subject of the coat of arms. The answer could be just to change the description, says this resident. He's got a name after all, Mauritius. Why shouldn't it be the Coburg Mauritius? Mauritius Pharmacy, Mauritius Street, that sounds better. So can you see here, can you see the shift? Coburg Moor, change to Coburg Mauritius, change to Coburg Maurice. That's where we're, that's where we're end, heading up here, isn't it? It's St. Maurice. It's got, he's got nothing to do with the royal family. He's got nothing to do with the actual Germans, there were no blacks in Germany, don't be stupid, it's just St. Maurice, he was a part of the Holy Roman Empire. Do you see how the theft takes place? This is this is how it takes place. Thank you very much, Eno, for your donation. I appreciate you, man. Um, he said, good job, thank you. I'm glad, I'm glad it's um, informative. How do you measure culture? What is racist? It's not easy to find the right balance especially not in Coburg. Okay, so yeah, I just wanted to show you that really quickly um, so you could see that this isn't a thing in the past, okay? This this is continuing. We have to be very aware, hopefully have our eyes open as to when they're utilising agendas like BLM or anything like that and see what actually what, what's taking place. I knew instantly when they started pulling down those statues that something was amiss. Because let me tell you something right now, being a black Brit, yeah? Black British people, we don't even, we're scared to protest. We ain't pulling down no statues, I'll tell you that for free, okay? <laughs> I'll tell you that for free. Ain't no, there weren't no black people involved in the pulling down of those statues, okay? Those were all people who had permission because no one's pulling down a statue in the UK and getting away with it. I'll tell you that right now for free. No one is pulling down a statue in the UK and getting away with it. They will give you life. I'll tell you that for free. They'll find a way to push it through Parliament to make sure that you never see daylight again. You didn't see any black people involved in that. So you have to you have to always check to see what's this little agenda that they're trying to play here. And it's normally not one that benefits us. Picked in the divine that has strong and resonant parallels today. Returning to Moorish artistry, we see this similarly echoed in the coats of arms of Sir Jean III de Grailly, who in 1364 commanded the forces of Charles II during the Hundred Years' War, until he was eventually defeated and captured, and who was hailed by chronicler Jean Frossart as an ideal of chivalry. We could look more broadly to major European families themselves. So I'm just going to have to pause it there really quickly, because I've just been given a amazing donation by Deshaun Willingham. Thank you so much, my brother. I really appreciate it. He said, bro, your name will be remembered along the likes of Diop and Ben, Dr. Ben, sorry. You're helping to rewrite history is so important. Thank you. Thank you, man. I appreciate you. hundred dollars. That is a massive, massive donation. And, you know, I feel, I actually feel quite <laughs> really honored because I'm playing someone else's content here. Um, so big up to you, Kapruki. Um, please show your um, show your appreciation for Kapruki. If you are not subscribed to him and you're on this live stream and there's 400 people on this live stream, 
and I'd suggest that probably at least half of you may not be subscribed to him yet. Make sure you do before this live stream ends, please. Because his channel is worth it. He, you know, quality over quantity. He has four videos and they are four of the most high quality videos you'll get in terms of black African, black and African history. So please, please, please. Um, thank you, Deshaun. I appreciate you, man. Thank you. And thank you to everyone who's donated thus far. Um, small, big donations. I appreciate you all, honestly. 100%. Such as the German Tuchers, a Protestant family based in the city of Nuremberg in which they played an important part in the economic and cultural development as well as in the local politics. And where in 1340 they were admitted to the governing council acquiring Simmelsdorf Castle in 1598 and becoming... So there's another one, Nuremberg. So we've got Nuremberg, Coburg, Mecklenburg, so many of these houses, these, you know, all of this, so many of these rural houses that are famous names today linked to Moors or established by Moors, established by black people, essentially. It's amazing. We could look to the coats of arms of the Pucci family, a prominent noble family in Florence over the course of many centuries and constant allies of the Medici's during the Renaissance being among the families that Cosimo de' Medici called upon as a means of indirectly pursuing his own political interests. When I see this image here, um, I know that said the Medici said that he has their car, I think it's the Cosimo de Medici. You've probably heard of the Medici family. They are a black family or black Italian, Italian? Yes, Italian family um, who, yeah, who, who ruled in Italy and Florence. Um, now, what's really interesting is this the reason I pause this here is because a British there's a British um what's the word Ju I want to say jewel kind of um relic for want of a better word that's not the best word um called the the Drake jewel okay and it's believed to um depict Sir Francis Drake I'll just pull it up really quickly um let me show it really quickly um and they'll give you once again similar ridiculous explanations as to why it looks this way. They'll say, oh, it's a depiction of his favorite slave or some stupidity like that. But <laughs> the reality is this matches descriptions of Sir Francis Drake, okay? one of the most famous British nobility. And it says here, like Africans and you know, this is, this is his jewel. So Francis Drake here at the front, and this matches his description because he was described as a tall and swarthy man. So all of this changing of artwork, changing of descriptions has happened historically across the continent. Um, I just want to shout, I've had another $20 donation. So massive thank you to Jay Muirhead. May the creator continue to use you to open people's eyes. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad this is uh, being a really impactful stream. Uh, amazing. Um, so, yeah, fantastic. And, well, I've got to have to read these all out now because I'm getting more again. Um, $20 from Cycle Cinco. Thank you very much. It says, thanks for the, thanks from the American Muslim Moors. We love your diligence. Thank you very much. I really, really appreciate that donation. $10 from Tracy. Um, thank you, Tracy. Oscarville, Georgia was a black town submerged underwater by white supremacy. Sonarka Village, a black neighborhood in New York City, demolished by white supremacy and is now Central Park. Thank you very much for that donation and for those facts. Um, another thing to look into as well, and I imagine I'll do a study on this coming soon, is the use of lakes to submerge history. One of the most famous ones is obviously Lake Nassau, which they used to submerge um, Nubia. They used to submerge black history in Nubia, but they're right across, right across the African, American, European continent, the use of man-made lakes. So wherever you see man-made lakes, there's normally some kind of civilization that they couldn't be bothered to deconstruct, so they just flooded it. In Nigeria, you have, I think, Lake Kalenjin, which I believe um, has submerged a great deal of our antiquities there um, and there's several lakes I think there's lakes in America several lakes in America that just sit on top of basically architecture ruins things that they didn't 
have the time or couldn't be bothered to actually completely deconstruct or to reface so they literally just would flood them so thank you for that fact there tracy and for that very generous donation appreciate you and macy thank you macy um by the way tracy and macy are both members of my patrons so they already support me so much i appreciate it says the king's monologue kings thank you for bringing thanks for bringing our history to light i appreciate that thank you very much really really appreciate all of that that was amazing <laughs> i'm literally falling off my chair here um thank you so much guys i really really appreciate it um yeah let me let this keep going the Medici's are themselves a family within whom we know there was considerable Negro strain, such as in Alessandro de' Medici, Duke of Penn, first Duke of the Florentine Republic, and ruler of Florence from 1530 to his death in 1537. A man who in life was also nicknamed Il Moro. We could even set our sights briefly to the consistency- And just really quickly on Alessandro de' Medici, those other de' Medici's who they've whitewashed. So I did a video a little while back about Lorenzo de Medici, who I think was his uncle, if I remember correctly. If you look up a picture of Lorenzo de Medici, you'll see a white man with long hair. But if you search long enough, you'll start to pull out the Moorish, swarthy pictures of him, where he just essentially looked like a, 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 a I would say, looks like a biracial person with kind of like long, thick hair and very dark skin. Um, once again, just hidden and obfuscated beneath all of the whitewashing that's taken place to kind of remove the black footprint the only one that's been allowed to survive is alessandro de medici and maybe that's because he was called il moro I'm not sure moorish iconography in the crests of cities and towns themselves as seen littered across the southern german state of bavaria we also see Moorish depictions or depictions of people of African descent outside of coats of arms in European artistry from pre-11th century across the eras into the modern period, of whom in many cases historians can't ascertain the specific identities of the figures or perhaps in some cases don't even bother to, generalising them as simply Africans. It's amazing, sorry, just on that point how all of these black people just become nameless it's just it's it's amazing and it's very very saddening i can't lie i i feel a very deep connection on this subject i don't know what it is and once again that could be ancestral i don't know but i feel a very deep connection on this subject when i see it and i see the way that essentially all of these people who had names who were rulers who were important who were even if they weren't important who were present and who were named have resulted in just becoming either being given a, a dumping ground name like Saint Maurice, where they just attribute some saint who's got nothing to do with them, or that is called a picture of a black man, a picture of a servant, a picture of a dressed up, you know, a dressed up slave or some other kind of nonsense. Yeah, it's just really sad. <laughs> or slaves. Returning to coats of arms, and with a now superficial recognition of the existence of Moorish iconography, we have to begin to inquire as to the relation between the Moors in question and the coats of arms of the people and families they're adorning. So that's part one. The image to the left is a very powerful image, and it's believed to be of Simonetta de Kovalich. Simonetta de Kovalich was the mother of Alexandra de Medici the African woman patriarch of the Medici family. At a certain point in Renaissance Europe, Alexander de Medici was the favored son of European society. He had at one point been targeted to marry the Charles, Charles V's daughter, which would have made him ultimately perhaps the successor to Charles V if he had not been assassinated. This is a person of African descent. Amazing. So uh, thank you. What That's, is- uh, Let me just pause that there. Um, this is actually not even watching this one. Um, that's part one and it's just turned 11 o'clock and I'm thinking I really enjoyed this subject and we could go on, but I don't want another four hour stream. I think two hours is just about digestible enough for people. <laughs>
And I think I can part two this and I will part two it literally within the next couple of days. So I'm thinking to myself, we got through part one, took a couple of hours. Really, it took about an hour because we started, we had a bit of, you know, build up an introduction. But I think let's do part two on a separate stream. So I think I'll do part two maybe in a couple of days time. I'll schedule it now. So I'm thinking possibly, possibly tomorrow night, actually, possibly tomorrow night or Wednesday night at the very latest, we'll get part two out of the way. But I think let's call it a day there because I think two hours is a good stream length. Um, and I think we've covered a good amount of information there. And I'm just really, really grateful for everyone who's joined me today. This has been a big crowd. We've had pretty much consistently held a crowd of 400 people here. And it's been an amazing amazing topic so i think we'll definitely have to yeah we'll do a part two to this hit up the likes if you're on the if you're on the stream now um massive massive i'm going to just give another massive shout out to all the people that gave donations today so macy tracy cycle um oh jame one second yeah yeah jame your head um d sean eno the milan messenger And there's others who are further up, but I think I've said thank you to you guys already. Really, really appreciate it. Wesker and uh, Kapruki, can we just like give him a massive, massive big up? If you could just thank him in the comments for his excellent content. I'm sure you guys have been doing that already, but please big up Kapruki because his content is absolutely amazing. Um, Wesker and both of them are mods as well so he's doing, he's also been managing the chat and getting rid of some of the trolls so it's been it's been kept pretty clear there which is really nice to see and everybody who's just been kind of contributing to the conversation today has been amazing I've really enjoyed it I don't feel the need to yeah yeah I don't, I'm not going to drag this on it's been really good I want to get some more stuff together for tomorrow so I think tomorrow what we'll do is we'll hit part two which actually I think is maybe even a little bit better than part one <laughs> to be honest with you it's really good but i also want to do a little bit of side reach research and bring some stuff to that as well and maybe i think i'll uncover some of the research that i'm doing so you'll get an idea about some of the videos that i'm going to be releasing on the subject in the coming weeks but yeah this has been amazingly motivating um just to see how eager and actually how positively received because i actually was really nervous about this topic i thought i was going to get a whole bunch of um <laughs> thought i was going to get a whole bunch of mm, are you sure about this mate but i think everyone appreciates uh, obviously a lot of the thanks is to go to kapuki for his fantastic level of research which is very hard to disagree with um it's just yeah it's been a fantastic stream really appreciate it. and i've had another Donation Nerd Large, thank you so much. It says, great work, a reminder that we're waiting on that vid on the true etymology of the word Negro. Yes, yes, I think that does need to come. <laughs> that does need to come. So um, I've got another video. I'll tell you what, actually for free, so you know, that one is kind of in production, but the next one that I'm probably going to release is a video about etymology and the true meaning of the word Kemet because that's kind of like a, a controversial one as well so I'm going to be releasing that very soon and maybe the Negro one will be a, a natural kind of like um, continuation to that video but yes that that is me I think I'll leave it there I think yeah it's been a really good stream two hours is a nice length thank you everybody who's bothered to um, join us today and yeah make sure you're here for the follow-up which i'm gonna put in I'll, I'll put in probably tomorrow by lunchtime you'll see it appear so it's either gonna be tomorrow evening i'll do it or we'll do it on the wednesday it's gonna be one or one or the other but make sure you join um it's been a fantastic stream thank you everyone um once again massive thanks to all everybody who's joined me everyone who's donated um yeah i don't think there's much more to say than that i'll see you very very soon thanks guys all the best all the best take care bye bye oh and hit like before you go people there he said so i was gonna say your name but i couldn't pronounce it <laughs>